This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Sylvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is November 16th, 2023. Jonathan Osborne here. I am back with my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, this was moments away from being one of the most depressing six-man shows of the season. Luckily, Paolo Bancaro came through and does what you expect a former number, number one overall pick, rookie of the year, the Magic's best player, fantastic shot to win the game. And I'm in such a better mood than I would have been had we lost this game because it Arguably would have been the worst loss of the season. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would have it would have been. I mean, you were up by 17, obviously, and whatever, we'll get into it. But yeah, that's what I was going to also say is, I mean, moments before this game ends, all I'm thinking, and, and to be honest, this is what I've been thinking all day, there is nothing worse than getting on this microphone at 11 o'clock at night, 11.30 at night, after your team has lost every time since the last time you recorded. Especially when it's back to back nights. Yeah. And the implications of, you know, the, the Brooklyn loss, which we'll talk all about, but luckily yeah. we had a, a W to get on here and discuss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm I am very relieved by that. Thank you to Paolo Bancaro for pulling this one out. A couple of uh, housekeeping things. I'm going to try to get through these pretty quickly, folks, so uh, just bear with us here. So we've got uh, next week, we've got the next two editions of the Six Fan Show that are being filmed. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is where we record Magic fans outside of Amway out, uh, right after games, try to get their live reactions to games and um, just the current standing of the Magic. Uh, so that is coming up on uh, the 21st and the 24th, so that's going to be next Tuesday, when we take on the Toronto Raptors, and then next Friday, Black Friday, when we take on the Boston Celtics. Both of those are going to be in-season tournament games, so really looking forward to those. They've been so much fun to start the year. We have a watch party coming up tomorrow. If you're listening to this on Thursday, our first watch party of the year, November 17th, Friday at Wall Street Plaza versus the Bulls again in the in-season tournament. Going to be a lot of fun. Uh, That is going to start... Right around 7.30, the festivities are going to get going there. But Michelob Ultra, again, helped sponsoring and putting on this event. There's going to be $5 Michelob Ultra bottles, $20 buckets of Michelob Ultra, and from 5 to 8 leading up to the watch party, there's going to be two-for-one drinks. So make sure that you guys come out. It's really going to be a lot of fun. Luke and I are going to talk about why this Bulls in-season tournament game is now even more important than it was even just a couple of days ago. The Magic desperately need to win that game, so we need your support. We need everybody out at Wall Street Plaza for this game. Going to be a ton of fun. And then, I I don't know what I'm more excited for, the watch party or this announcement from Duvin. If you remember last year, uh, Duvin put out this awesome collaboration that they did with the Orlando Magic releasing like this Duvin Orlando Magic uh, mashup, if you will, uh, this line of apparel, which they incorporate a lot of like the old school Orlando Magic logos. Well, I'm here to let you know that Duvin and the Orlando Magic are running it back once again. Last year's drop sold out in hours, folks. So you're going to want to pay close attention to the details that I'm about to give you. This drop will not be available online. It will only be available for purchase in person On November 30th, that's going to be uh, the Thursday after Thanksgiving. So November 30th from 4 to 10, the Duvin Magic pop-up is going to be at the yard on Ivanhoe. And then they'll also be available for purchase. Whatever doesn't sell out at the pop-up will be available for purchase on December 1st at 7 p.m. when the Magic take on the Wizards at home in the Magic Team Shop and at the Magic Team Shop in Concourse uh, Section 107. So be sure to check that out. If you want to go to the pop-up, you can check our Twitter. Our pinned tweet has the Eventbrite link so that you can uh, register an RSVP RSVP to get your tickets for the in-person pop-up. Again, you guys will not want to miss this. The the line looks incredible. I'm going to be there. Luke, I don't know if you'll be able to make it, but it was a great event last year. 
I still wear their stuff all the time. Like literally like every third day you'll, you can catch me rocking something from the Duvin drop last year. So I just, I cannot wait for this drop Luke. Yeah. The, what was it? The, from the picture that we posted, that shirt is very sick. The, the I believe uh, in magic. Yeah. The graphic on that is awesome. I had a so couple what, people that had replied or sent it to me that I know. And they were like, dude, this shirt is amazing. So it's the, yeah, I believe in magic with the top hat upside down, the basketball coming out of it with like an orange leaf on the top. So it's supposed to also fire. look like an orange, obviously, with the uh, wand. Man, it is it is incredible. If you guys haven't seen that, go check it out. We posted about it um, as you guys are listening to this yesterday um, in the afternoon time around like, you know, five, five, four or five o'clock yesterday. So go check that out and uh, hope to see you guys there. Yeah, hope to see you guys there. Let's talk the state of the Magic this week so far. The Luke, uh, Luke the Magic are one and one with a loss to the Nets on Tuesday and a win Wednesday over the Bulls. They currently sit ninth in the Eastern Conference standings with a record of six and five. They're tied with New York, Brooklyn, and Atlanta. Uh, one game up on Toronto, however, the Magic are 26th in the NBA in offensive rating. Offensive rating just continues to drop for this team. Their offensive rating is 108.9. Still third in the NBA in defensive rating with a 107. They are 12th in net rating with a 1.8. Looking at the injury report, Markel Fultz and Wendell Carter remain out. Uh, Wendell Carter, uh, obviously, with the the fractured finger. Uh, Markel Fultz uh, still with the, uh, I guess they're calling it left knee, like tendonitis now that they're continuing to monitor. It, it is sort of like increasingly becoming concerning. I know you and Kevin uh, talked about that on uh, the last pod, which give a if you guys were in the car, just give a give Kevin and Luke a little uh, round of uh, of applause for uh, you know making sure that a uh, last episode Appreciate happened that. because I just I, it was definitely not happening with me. I was in a in a rough way. Um, <laughs> what was that Sunday and and Monday really and and part of Tuesday? So appreciate the boys. Uh, Gary Harris returned to the lineup Wednesday after missing uh, the past five games with a strained groin, and I, I would feel remiss if we did not mention this. Jonathan Isaac, Tuesday and Wednesday, played his first back-to-back consecutive games in consecutive days, the first time since December of 2019. Luke, it was over 1,400 days since Jonathan Isaac had played both parts of a back-to-back. It, it's honestly incredible. Now he's been playing you know, between like 17-ish minutes a game, last handful of games here. Beginning of the year was you know playing eight minutes, ten minutes, twelve minutes, slowly creeping up, and now we're at the point where not only is he playing you know multiple stints in these games, sometimes three stints because he's been closing out a lot of these games recently with Wendell Carter Jr. out of the lineup, but now playing in a back to back. We're eleven games in now. I did not expect Jonathan Isaac to be playing this much this early in the season. I I mean, none of us did. You and I talked about the fact that he might not play a back-to-back all year. And he might this not play... This was our second back-to-back of the season, I think. Or th- second or third back-to-back. Could and be. he's already playing, so... Yeah, I mean, regardless. Yeah, regardless of, of which number back-to-back we're on. Yeah, he's playing, and it's not even Thanksgiving yet. He's playing on back-to-backs. Not just that. He's he's playing, what, 16, some, 16 and some change minutes tonight against the Bulls? After playing what twelve, thirteen, but twelve minutes the night before, so you know, <clears throat> hopefully, Jonathan, we get to a point where, and maybe this will be the case the next time around, that he's playing sixteen, seventeen minutes on the first night of a back to back, and sixteen to seventeen on the next night of back to back. He's not that far off at this point. And guess what, Jonathan? We'll talk. We, we'll, we will do more of this, but he didn't. He didn't look gassed to me. At any point tonight, he's in the closing lineup. I think three of the last three games where it was warranted. So, Jonathan Isaac, man, he, he he's back, and he's definitely back defensively. I I can't help but laugh when we just look back and like the the video from him in the locker room where he was trying to step out of frame and took like a really long step. What was that? Two seasons ago now, and people were like, "He's cooked. He can't walk. He's never going to play basketball again." So on and so forth. And then a little bit more, understandably, when he was you know doing the the book and was doing all the media and all the press, and people were like, "Oh, he's moved on. He's moving into politics. He's ne- he doesn't want to play basketball anymore. He's not a basketball player. He's going to retire." Blah blah blah. 
And at, even in the moment, it was like, come on, guys. Like, we are, we are jumping to so many conclusions. And now when we watch games and like, well, I know we're going to talk about the Bulls game, but that stretch in the first half where the second unit just took over. And for a while, it was like, oh, this game isn't even going to be close because the way that the second unit was playing, where we were like, Jonathan Isaac looks as good defensively as he ever did. How is this possible? It's legitimately a miracle. And it, it's just so much fun. And I, I just, I really hope that it continues. Yeah, you and me both. Okay, we have to talk about this, uh, this game against the, the Nets from Tuesday, which we'll talk a little bit about it now. And then we'll talk a little bit about it after we talk about the Bulls game. Because even though the results of these games were drastically different, there are, are patterns, there are similarities between both games and, and patterns that are now forming over the first 11 games of the season. So this game, the Magic get off to a really rough start Tuesday uh, in Brooklyn. No Markel still, no Gary Harris, no Wendell Carter Jr. But the Magic were down by as much as 14 in the first quarter. It looked like it was going to get pretty ugly. But the Magic were able to storm back, uh, take a 3.60 to 57 lead into the half. The Magic shoot 52% from the floor in the first half, 43% from behind the arc. They happen to put Nick Claxton in foul trouble. And then his uh, replacement or his backup, Dayron Sharp, also had three personal fouls in the first half. So seven fouls between their first and second string center. Magic were doing a really good job in the first 14 free throws, getting to the rim, getting to the line, putting pressure on the Nets defense, putting their big men in foul trouble. In the second half, we keep talking about this and it's so cliche, but the tale of two halves. Second half, the Magic give up 67 points to the Brooklyn Nets. The Magic shoot 36% from the floor, 26% from behind the arc, only shoot seven free throws. Royce, uh, not Royce O'Neal, Dayron Sharp ends up fouling out of this game. But Nick Claxton plays 15 minutes in the second half with four fouls. The Magic don't force him to commit a, a, a single foul in the second half. I really thought the Magic left uh, a lot of points on the board, not getting to the rim. They let Nick Claxton off the hook. They let the Brooklyn Nets off the hook by settling for three-pointers in that second half, getting away from what made them successful in the first half. And now, Luke, we have just another example of the Magic playing fantastic basketball in the first half, not being able to put anything together offensively in the second half letting that affect their defense. And what it was really an important game for the Magic with this being an in-season tournament game. It turns into a game that was winnable that you end up losing by 20 points. What were the takeaways for you in this one? The the takeaways for me is, I mean, you're shooting, you know, you're shooting well from beyond the arc. And then it's like, it doesn't end up even... It's not going to matter because Brooklyn goes on to shoot the lights out in this one, almost 49% from three on 39 attempts. The Magic have a a consistent thing going here, which is when the Magic, uh, essentially what I had looked at today, because um, let's see, Jake Chapman put something out earlier, Jonathan, in regard to, you know, it's ironic that in wins, the Magic shoot 33% from three and in losses they shoot 33 percent from three so i was like yeah but what is the the attempts discrepancy and ultimately what this comes down to is the magic in losses shoot 33 or 33 and on average 33 threes a game and wins they shoot 30 now for people that might not look much at three-point attempts or makes this boils down to uh like three attempts that's a huge difference if you look at the standings of teams and how many threes they shoot per game that go takes that flies you up like i don't even know like seven eight spots and attempts a game from three like it is a significant thing so this team you do not want to get in a shootout honestly with with any team because the chances are they're a better three-point shooting team than you and at this point what there's probably 25 teams that are better three-point shooting teams than the magic maybe something crazy like that And um, it's just not something you want to do. And so the Nets in this one just shoot the lights out and the Magic 
quite literally shoot themselves out of this game when they stop touch, getting pay and touches. So I've got the numbers here. Uh, I pulled them up. So 30 attempts would put you at 27th in the league. Uh, three more attempts put you somewhere around you know, 18, 17. So yeah. about 10 spots in, in just three attempts. It's a significant difference in scheme and all of that. So it is something for sure that that's the discrepancy and that's the results in these games. Yeah, really what it, it came down to, I mean, you have to give credit to, to Brooklyn. Like they were making really tough, difficult, contested shots. But the Magic, I mean, Paolo, to Paolo's credit, shot the ball really well in this game. Ends up with 19 points, a four of seven from behind the arc. Um, it, it does feel like right now and, and early in his career, if Paolo gets it going from behind the arc, and not even necessarily from behind the arc, if the long twos are falling and Paolo's like, okay, I, I'm feeling it, he kind of falls in love with that a little bit. Looking at the the second half for Paolo, um, uh, let's see. It was one for two from the free throw line for Powell. That's just it's just not going to be good enough for us. And again, when you did such a good job going back to the first half in this one, the Magic have fourteen free throw attempts. You have seven. You have half of that in the second half. It really just came down to they stopped attacking Brooklyn at the rim. And Nick Claxton, who is a you know big defensive presence for them, him being in foul trouble for the better part of that first half allowed the magic to stay aggressive and he you know in terms of like recording blocks two blocks in the second half that's pretty on par for nick claxton it's not like he was just you know gobbling i gobbling swallowing i i didn't know where to go here it's not like he was just erasing every opportunity that the magic had at the rim right like they they in my opinion just really bailed brooklyn out in this game they responded by hitting big shots but the Magic you know, gave this game away. I know it looks like a, a 20 point loss on paper. This game was was not that far out of reach. This game really got out of reach in the last couple of minutes. Guys, you know, like Spencer Dinwiddie, you know, hitting a, a few big shots, hit a hit a big contested three at the end of this game. But the problem is now, Luke, one of the the tiebreakers when it comes to the in season tournament is point differential. And the Magic start the in season tournament now. With a, a point differential of negative twenty, I'm going to pull up the in-season tournament uh, standings right now. Looking at at Group uh, East C, Toronto Raptors haven't played a game yet, so they're still technically uh, or you know, hasn't uh, recorded a, a game yet, so they're still technically in, in last place. But you look at the Magic; they're they're right there. They're zero and one with a negative twenty point differential. Boston is one and zero; they have a plus fourteen. Brooklyn is two and one with a plus eight. So head-to-head record is going to matter as well. So for the Magic to even have a chance to advance in the in-season tournament, they're going to need Toronto to beat Brooklyn. Like if if Brooklyn finishes three and one, the Magic aren't going to have a, a chance to make it out of the in-season tournament. And then you still got to beat Chicago, Toronto, and Boston if you're going to have a chance. And you probably need to blow out each of these teams if you're going to have a legitimate shot to come out of the in-season tournament. So. The, the lack of energy that we saw, like right off the rip, again, we talked about this team going down 14 points in the f- first quarter, fought back to take the lead. You have the lead at the half, uh, but just to see the egg that they laid in the second half, or you know, obviously the in-season tournament has been a, a hot button topic with every single team in the NBA, first year of the in-season tournament, and you expected the Magic to come out and, and, and play really well in this game, especially the first night of a back-to-back. I, 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 there's no way that you could count on going into Chicago and beating the Bulls the second night of a back-to-back. Now these all come out to regular season games anyway, but this being the first in-season tournament game, and as much as the Magic talked about like really wanting to be competitive in that, they might have already ruined their in-season tournament chances after one game. Here's my thing. I saw a lot of people today talking about point differential and. I saw someone talking about how Mosley didn't leave the starters in long enough in this one. And to that point, I would say that's just very not true because Franz Wagner, Paolo checks out of this game down 16 with two minutes left. How much longer do you want him to stay in the game? Franz Wagner checks out with like 58 seconds left. You're down 18 at that point. The starters, it, to me, it felt like Mosley was playing for point differential in this one, and they just couldn't mount any type of. It really, they couldn't so was narrow Brooklyn, the gap. By the way, huh? Yeah, so it was Brooklyn. 
Yeah, I mean, at that point, you're both playing the in-season tournament game. But in in my opinion, when you're down whatever it is, eight sixteen, with four minutes to go, three minutes to go, just pull the starters. I don't. I didn't understand it. Like you've got a back to back coming up. Thankfully, the Magic win this game against Chicago. But I, in my opinion, I didn't love that the guys were still playing in this game. I was happy to see that in some respect, like we're taking the end season tournament seriously in this point differential thing. But if you're down 15 plus with two and a half minutes to go, you're not coming back. So for me, I was a little irritated with that. I would have appreciated them coming out sooner because God forbid one of those guys either plays too many minutes and is gassed in this game against Chicago tonight or B they get injured. I just don't want any part of that. I don't want to chance anything. Get your guys out of there. Get Jet Howard and the guys in way sooner. And let's get out of there because you lost. You took the L. Whatever happens, happens with the end season tournament at that point. Go and win the game in Chicago the next night. Because I, I, that's where I'm at as far as this goes and how we're managing the end season tournament versus regular season games. Give me the win in the regular season game if that means that like pulling your starters sooner in the in-season tournament game the night before so that I can give myself and this team can give themselves a better chance to win. Just get another notch in the belt. At the end of the day, I just care about making the postseason. If I'm having to pick and choose, would I love to win the in-season tournament? Would I love to make it to the knockout round and have the team go to Vegas? Absolutely. But am I going to sacrifice all that and not win some of these regular season games that are attainable? You're playing against a, t- a Bulls team that, quite frankly, has imploded. Their look, their star is ready to get out of there. They're ready to get them out of there. You can't lose that this game tonight. And I, I think you got to prioritize that and just getting regular season wins on top of the end season tournament. I guarantee you, if we were to wake up Sunday, April fifteenth, the day after the final day of the regular season, and we're a game or two short of the playoffs to play in, whatever. Even if we let's say we win the in season tournament, like we we win the entire thing, right? But you go on to to miss the playoffs. Going back to this Brooklyn game, right? Like let's say the Magic lose to the Bulls. Let's say you're very fortunate that that Bulls game doesn't go in overtime tonight. Yeah. The Magic didn't look completely gassed at the end of that, but I guarantee you that was a real possibility going into overtime that the guys yeah. just ran out of gas being the second night of a back to back. April 15th comes around, the Magic are sitting around not in the playoffs. I guarantee you we would have gone back and traded some of that point differential for another win that would have got us in. Even if we won the entire freaking in-season tournament, I will take a playoff berth or a play-in berth over winning the entire in-season tournament right now. I I also want to let you guys in on a secret here. Here's the secret. This in-season tournament wraps up in what, December? Is that right? You win the in-season tournament as the Orlando Magic. Do you do you think people are going to take you seriously? No. They're not going to. They're going to do the same thing they did with the Lakers in the bubble when they won the championship. A Mickey Mouse ring, whatever. And then in December, people would be saying, congrats, the Magic, the freaking Magic. That's how much of a joke this in-season tournament is. The Magic won it. I don't care about the in-season tournament. <laughs> you know at this what point. though? If we won the in-season tournament, I'd be like, the league is screwed, baby. Like we're and, we're and everybody else for would be laughing because they don't care. Screwed. I just, we're used to that. I I I understand what, what you're saying, saying, but I don't I don't put any. Yes, I understand that. But there are people who want it to gain respect. I don't think you're going to gain respect by winning the in-season, in-season tournament. If I'm being quite honest, they're going to think of every way to discredit the Magic from winning because they won the thing, and they're going to say this is how much it doesn't matter. Because I will this, probably guarantee the team that wins the in-season tournament makes the playoffs. I'll almost guarantee that. Well, of, of, sure. But I'm saying in the moment, the Magic win it. You're not going to. And then, if, and then, like you said, if that scenario did play out, Magic won the in-season tournament, but somehow, some way, they missed the postseason, you're going to be clowned. And the in-season tournament's going to be clowned. It's going to be bad for the reputation of that thing. And it might harm its longevity in this league. But, yeah, I... I we we will see how it plays out. But for me, man, I realized a lot about myself in this Brooklyn Nets game. I realized I don't care that much about the in-season tournament after you lose by 20 and everybody's uh, like picking sides about it. It is what it is. And if the Magic do well, I hope they do because guess what? That means we were winning games. But I realized last night 
sitting there after the loss. I was more mad that we lost the game than that we lost an in-season tournament game, if I'm being quite honest. I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to get behind the in-season tournament. Like I want it to be successful. I have successful. been to this point, but it was like just like a at, realization for me. Yeah, you look at other you know tournaments, like just in other major sports, and you know I, I think it's it's cool if it can, like if people, the thing is everybody has to buy in. The players have to buy in. The league has to buy in. Fans have to buy in as well. And some of the games have been pretty exciting so far. The Magic game was definitely not exciting. Now, I do have money on you know what's happening there, so I, I do care about that. A point, a point that I want to make really quickly, I was thinking about this earlier today. We're talking about how the Magic need to blow out everybody the rest of the way if they're going to have any shot and they need you know some luck. You know, we need the, the Nets to lose. The Magic blow out the Bulls on Friday, right? Awesome. They blow out the Raptors on, on Tuesday. Awesome. You think the league wants the Orlando Magic making the knockout round of the in-season tournament over the Boston Celtics? The Magic are going to have to win that game by 30 to actually win it. Because if the refs, if it's a 12, 15 point game in the second half, I will bet every bit of that $1,400 that I would win from the Magic winning the this group stage that the refs will get involved and find a way to make that game closer than it should be. If the refs have a chance to make that Boston game close, if that is going to make or break the Celtics moving to the group stage, which it, it, it very well might, the Magic are going to have to win that game by 20 to be able to actually win that game. Yeah. Because the refs and, are going to get involved in the second half. And and here's Guaranteed. the... Okay. So since because this this Bulls game that we're going to recap after all of this is not in season tournament yet, obviously. I I don't I don't know with this end season tournament with Brooklyn, what they've got to basically for the Magic to get out of the group stage. Yes, the Magic have to essentially because the first tiebreaker is head to head, correct? Right. I, I think that's right. Yeah. So the Magic have to win out including obviously the Boston Celtics in this scenario. So even if the if Boston were to drop the game to us, they win the other three, we would win because we have the head-to-head. But then you need Brooklyn to lose, what, two games total. So they need to lose, and they they've already played the Celtics. Toronto. So they have to lose to Toronto. So I, yeah, we you got to hope for something crazy to happen there. I don't know that they're going to lose to Toronto. Have they... No, the the Celtics are one and zero. So Brooklyn hasn't played. Uh, Brooklyn hasn't played the Celtics. They're not going to beat the Celtics though. So we need. Yes, yes, they did. They played the Celtics November. Celtics 10th. are one and zero in the East Group C standings. Yeah, right and now. they've only played the Nets. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. I thought you were asking if the the Nets beat the Celtics. Sorry, I misunderstood. No, no, no. no. Oh, so yeah, we yeah. need them to lose to the Raptors. We need the the Raptors to beat the Nets. And that's November 28th, by the way. So mark your calendars if you want to. So we have to go through our games and then we have to wait four extra freaking days to see what happens with that. Yeah, so We're you really could win out for Toronto, and then the Nets, <laughs> the Nets beat the Raptors and none of it matters. Right. But yeah. you'll have three extra regular season wins at that point. So, you yeah. know. That you will. Okay, let's take a quick break, and then we'll talk about that awesome win over the... Maybe it wasn't an awesome win. It was an awesome finish, that's for sure. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, a quick word about our wonderful patrons, uh, the folks that help financially support every single episode, every single thing that we do here. Um, If you're interested in being part of our Patreon community, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. And just wanted to um, give you all a, a quick message because we've gotten... Uh, especially folks that have been in our Discord uh, recently, they've realized that they haven't had access to our Discord, and it's because about a year ago this time they purchased like an annual uh, membership to our Patreon, and that has sort of like since rolled off. So uh, if you were an annual member of our Patreon, or you just realized that hey, I had Discord access before, but I don't now, uh, go to your Patreon, and I'm not by no means like please come back to our Patreon, but we would love to have you. So. Uh, if you'd like to continue supporting the show and you know you want to continue having access to our Discord community, um, just make sure that your your Patreon is active. You don't necessarily have to go annual again, although we love that and that's really awesome. Um, but if you want to go, you know, month to month, like even um, our All Star tier 
includes you know all of our Discord uh, benefits. So we've got a few questions about that recently. So I figured I'd just take a quick second to um, let you guys know that if you're having any issues like that, that's probably what has happened. So if you purchase an annual you know Patreon membership about a year ago, you might want to check on that to see if you're uh, due to re-up that. Um, but one of the things that we do for our patrons is we give our Hall of Fame and Elite Tier patrons a very special shout out on each and every episode. As always, I'll go ahead and start with the Court Cousins and then Drew Gooden, Armin, Carson Tulo, Jonathan Borges, Normal, Magic Player History, Gabe Gaines, uh, Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Michael Salapong, Donkey Punch, Dave, Paolo and Franz is Warmth, Pierre A, Dylan Holden, Mr. Mikey, Eduardo Sanchez, congratulations, Mikey, Daniel, Dodo 15, Bobby Skinner, Godi 93, Teddy Sylvia, Eric Lopez, Fuchsia, Bill, uh, Bill Fulton, Edmund Lagone, Jose Esquilin, Caleb Pete, Cannibalism, Time, Mr. TV, ESPN Really Sucks, Gear 95, Shred, Junior Bruce, Half Reek, and Shahin 177, Will Be the Dawn, Himlo Ban Himro, R Improv 221, Ray Pastrana, Spanking Season, Soft Taco, Victor Cologne, Irish, Mag- Irish Magic Mike, Austin Lampy, uh, Random Hustle, Only Franz, Maria, Keith Walsh, Fritz, Currency Kev, Bruv Sal, Kaysen Green, Santi Leon, Kane Eckler, The Distract, and Ahmad Timsa. A big thanks to all of our patrons. Again, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. Luke, do you want to talk a little jam hot chicken for us? You know, I was hoping you'd ask me about the guys and gals over there at jam hot chicken. Jam hot chicken. If you guys have been listening for any time at all, you know, they are a fan favorite. They're our favorite jam. Hot chicken is bringing jams, culture and hot chicken to the heart of winter park. It's a Nashville and L.A. inspired uh, chicken shack locally owned and operated in Winter Park. So if you guys go to 400 West New England Avenue, Suite 13 in Hannibal Square, you guys can go there, order. You can go online, jamhotchickenfl.com. Look at the menu, online ordering, order ahead, music playlist, all things jam hot. If you guys go there, tell them the guys at the Six Man Show sent you. Now let's talk about this game, Luke against the Chicago Bulls from Wednesday night. What really shouldn't have been a thriller, but ended up being a thriller, was almost a heartbreaker, uh, and then it ended up being a heartbreaker for the other guys. Uh, the 96-94 to 94 win for the Orlando Magic, they held as big of a 19-point lead in this game. Zach Levine, two huge threes down the stretch to tie the game up with seven and a half seconds left. The Magic go to their sidelines out of bounds. End of the game play to Paolo Bancaro. Puts uh, Alex Caruso on his back. Dribbles into the middle of the lane. Hits the turnaround with about 1.4 seconds left uh, to put the Magic up two. The Bulls don't get a shot attempt up at the end of the game. And the Magic again escape with a victory from Chicago Luke. Another game where the Magic played a great first half. Not as good of a second half. This game was way closer than it should have been. We were totally prepared to get on and rant about the issues of this team, how bad they've been in second halves. Really, and I don't think we're going to get away from that, to to be totally honest with you, because the, the problems are still there. The issues are still there. The questions are still there. But as we talked about at the top of the show, it's so much better to come on here and talk about a game winner than it is to talk about how the Magic just squandered the lead and ended up losing a game that they really should have won. I, uh, this was such a frustrating game, to say the least. And yeah, we were seconds away from getting on here, or I guess it would have been minutes. You would have gone to overtime and talking about how frustrating this second half collapses. And we're still going to talk about it because there's no way around it. It just doesn't make sense to me. Well, it does make sense to me. The first half, teams are regardless. They're they're letting you shoot the three whenever you want it, and really, you're just they're they're letting you and daring you to shoot these threes. This is something that Jamal Mosley talked about in the press conference after the Brooklyn game. I think it might have been Dan Savage um, who asked it just about teams packing the paint and do you feel like that's the game plan for against when you when teams that go against you and he was like yep that's that's the game plan that's all there is to it man and that's what this team is going to fall into but right now markel fultz is not going to help your shooting but he is going to help you with tempo pace steadiness and getting guys involved there's so much standing around happening jonathan 
isolation is le- legitimately so hard to watch, especially when everybody is just stagnant. Nobody's cutting off ball. I don't know what is going on, but this team just seems to like, they don't know what to do. Nobody seems to know what to do in these situations. You're not getting paint touches anymore. You're not spraying it out to the to the perimeter because you probably don't trust your shot at this point. Your confidence is shot. You don't want to try to shoot yourself back into the game, but instead you just take the shot clock down to the final seconds and hope that your shot goes in, and that's not going to cut it, and it is going to present a lot of really, really irritating scenarios for this team the rest of the season. Like you said, I don't know that there's a way out of this. I really don't. So maybe the Magic will unlock it. Maybe Mosley will unlock it. But I fear that the at halftime, listen, going in after at after this game, the Magic have had the lead at halftime in, I believe, every game except for one. That is just crazy to me. So I, I, I and now at that point, you're, I mean, man, the second half just never feels safe. I've got some numbers for us, and I, I, I feel like it just sort of helps add context to the conversation. I don't think there's anyone out there watching these games that think, oh, these guys are just so overblowing the differences in the, the first and second half. But if there is some psycho out there thinking that, I've got some numbers for you. In the first half uh, of all you know NBA games, right, like every single team in the league, the Magic in first halves of their 11 games so far would be third in offensive rating in the entire NBA. They would be first in defensive rating. They would be first in net rating. So in the first half of games, through 11 games this year, the Magic are the absolute best team in the NBA. And it's really the second quarter where the Magic are just overwhelming teams completely because they're, they've been pretty mediocre in first quarters. If you look at you know the, the, the ratings uh, by quarter, it's the Magic are just dominating the second quarters right now. Now, when we look at the second halves, and, and folks, you, you may want to just take a breath before I, I read this to you because it is a stark difference. In second halves this year, the Magic are 30th in offensive rating. I test checks out. 16th in defensive rating, and they are 29th in net rating. The only team in the NBA that has been worse than the Orlando Magic this year in second halves are the San Antonio Spurs. And my thing is, yes, teams game planning to force the Magic into taking threes is part of it. But teams are not saying, hey, we're going to let the Magic do whatever they want in the first half, and then we're going to force them to take threes in the second half. When you look at the, what was it, 40 six threes, whatever it was, um, Tuesday night against the Brooklyn Nets. I'm pretty sure the Magic took 23 in the first half, 23 in the second half. Not much is changing there in terms of the game plan. I, I may have those numbers slightly off, but I'm pretty sure it's close to dead even in the first and second half, specifically against Brooklyn on Tuesday. Teams are not saying in the second half, okay, now we're going to make the, the Magic take threes. What I think is happening Sure, the offense is going stagnant. As soon as the offense goes stagnant, the Magic are starting to panic. Teams are gaining momentum. They're getting back in these games. And then specifically down the stretch, because the Magic are still learning how to win these games, how to win these close games, how to win these games tight. And and they are getting tight. These guys are are second-guessing themselves. We're not seeing them, like, for, for the most part, guys are watching Paolo and Franz dribble. Like it's hey, it, these are our best guys. It's their turn to go out and make plays, and those guys are really struggling with the spacing at that point. Guys are not knocking down shots. We saw it. What was it in the in the game against the Mavericks? The Magic went 18 minutes without hitting a three in the second half. That just can't happen. The Magic went how long? Luckily, the Bulls did as well. But the Magic went how long in the first half of this Bulls game without hitting a single three? This is one of the ugliest games offensively that you could ask somebody to sit and watch. And yes, the the spacing is absolutely an issue. I was totally prepared to get on here, and I, I, I think we still have to ask the question, when Mosley sees that these guys are tightening up and the offense is just coming to a screeching halt and no one is able to do anything, at what point do you say, you know what? We just need to throw as much spacing out there around Paolo and around France as possible. Because look, if you're going to dare Gary Harris, Joe Ingles, and Cole Anthony to hit threes around Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner, I will take those odds every single night. But instead, we continue to have Anthony Black out there 
I love Jalen Suggs, but he's not knocking down threes in the way that we need him to. We still have Goga Batadze out there. Mo Wagner has been okay from behind the arc, but nowhere near would, would we say he's like a, a floor bending, you know, big for this team. You need to just say at some point, look, we're going to mix this up a little bit. Let's put a bunch of shooters around these guys. Even if that's Caleb Houston and Jet, Jed Howard coming in off the bench, try something. Because through 11 games, the offense is dead last in the second half of these games. And I, I can tell you what, having more spacing on the floor isn't going to hurt it. It's as bad as it possibly can be, Jamal. Do something. Even if it gets worse, you were still dead last in the league and you tried something. Right now we're doing worse. the same thing over and over and over again. And we're wondering, why does this continue to happen? Markel Fultz not being in these games, absolutely a factor. Wendell Carter not being in these games, absolutely a factor. But guess what? Those guys are not available to be on the floor right now. You've got to go to some guys that are, that are going to help space the floor. Like You have to try something. Is Caleb Houston going to be the answer? Probably not. Is Jed Howard going to be the answer? Probably not. But let's try something. Am I, am I campaigning to put both of those guys out on the floor at the same time? No, we did that at the end of the, the Brooklyn Nets game, but that game was already over. I think we can all agree on that. But why not try a lineup where you're playing Paolo at the five and you've got uh, Joe Ingles and Gary Harris out there now that those guys, both of those guys were available in this game. You could have put those guys out there around Paolo, and I think they did try it for a, a couple of minutes tonight, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But man, you, you've got to get a longer look at it. Because asking Paolo and Franz to just dribble through four guys and try to have a miraculous finish at the rim like Paolo did down the stretch of this game. I think he had like the Magic's, you know, last eight points in this game. He had a layup, a three, and then, you know, had the game winner at the end. He barely got off that first attempt at the rim. And I, I don't want to call it lucky, but it was not a great look for Paolo. It was just a great player making a, a, a great shot. And we've got to do something to give these guys a better opportunity when the offense is just coming to an absolute stop in the second half of these games. For me, it's this is where it's going to be pivotal to get Wendell Carter Jr. back. I know to this point in the games that he has played, he is not the efficient perimeter shooter that we got to know even last year where he shoots 35.5% from three on basically four attempts. This year, in five games, he's shot about three a game and 31.5%, give or take, right? I would still prefer that. I know that Jonathan Isaac, what he brings defensively to this team, and he creates a lot of problems on that side of the ball, but I will feel a lot better offensively, and I will live with Wendell Carter Jr.'s defense down the stretch because, to be honest with you, he we've talked about it. He's not a shot blocker, but he has a great rim deterrent. And that's all I need. If it comes down to who I trust more shooting a three from the corner at the end of the game, Wendell Carter or Jonathan Isaac, I'm giving it to Wendell every single time. I've seen him do it. So, and then and up to this point in the season, he's not shooting great uh, from like the center from three from the top. He's not shooting. He's like, Oh five, but from the corners, he's very respectable. I just want more options to space the floor. Like you said, I'm putting Dell in there at the five or I'm totally fine with at this point, exploring Paolo at the five and bringing in guys like Joe and Gary in to see what they can do because I don't think it gets worse. It just can't. I mean, you listed the numbers. It can't get worse for this team, especially in the second half. And yes, to your point in the third quarter, we have noted how much of a struggle that has been. Because at the beginning, team punches you in the mouth. And if you don't respond well, all of a sudden you're trying, you're panicking and you're trying to shoot yourself back into the game. Or everyone's all tight and they don't want to put the ball up. They don't want to shoot because they don't want to be the reason that, this, that the, the, the hole gets buried even deeper in this game, in any games that are close like this. And then all of a sudden you're dribbling out and you look up and there's no time left on the shot clock and someone's got to heave it. You hope it goes in. Paolo Bancaro, when you talk about circus shots and you just kind of getting lucky. That the, the, these shots are happening and going in now a Paolo, like you said, I don't know that it's, it's definitely not all luck by any means. Paolo has the capability. He has the confidence to make these take and make these shots, 
but against the Utah Jazz. Same thing. That game could have gone different. You were just seconds away from going to overtime, but Paolo makes that circus shot with his offhand, offhand, I believe, to win that game, essentially. So, listen, you need to create opportunity for this team down the stretch, and you were not doing this team any favors by just telling Paolo and, Paolo and Franz, hey, go figure it out. You know what a lot of these stars have in common, Jonathan, these guys that you can give the ball to down the stretch and just say, hey, make something happen? They've all got shooters. These guys aren't a one-man army, unless you're maybe Jokic. But regardless, Jokic has some shooters. Like they, they All these guys have shooters. They can score and they can facilitate, and we have seen Paolo's ability to facilitate. We've seen it from Franz before. He's ran the point for this team a few times. We know that they these guys are capable of playmaking. We need to just put shooters around them in the clutch so that when everybody collapses, they can kick it out to somebody and not hesitate because that guy shoots 20% from three or 24%, 25%, whatever it might be. You just got to give them chances. This is about Paolo and Franz, if we're being completely honest, like in terms of who you're going to build around and how these guys can best succeed. That's how you do it. You, you have got to put any shooters, and I don't care where you get them from, put them in the game. Now, like the the shooting, like absolutely needs to improve, right? And I think I'm, I'm like more. A, I'm not saying like, oh, second half comes around, stop playing Jalen Suggs and stop playing Anthony Black and all that kind of stuff. But in the moments that you notice that like the offense is really sputtering and struggling, that's when you need to 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 give it a little, you know, a little injection of a uh, of a adrenaline, like give it some life, change things up. Like these guys aren't going to figure it out until they figure it out. When I talk about these guys like getting tight, you know, in the second half of games, that's not a critique. That's reality. These guys have have gone through so many of these games, you know, especially a guy like Franz. Last two seasons of being up in games and then blowing second half leads and, and losing close games. You're going to have those jitters until you've been there time and time and time again, and you just figure out how to win in those situations. The Magic still have to go through that, but we can't just do this every single game and squander away lead after lead, watching leads go from a 19-point lead like it was tonight to, oh, it's a 10-point lead. Oh, well, oh, we got it back up to 14. Well, now it's back to 10. Oh, now it's an 8-point lead. Oh, now it's a 5-point lead. Oh, my gosh, they just tied the game. Oh, now we're going to go to overtime in the second night of a back-to-back. I think Jamal Mosley's timeouts were were better placed tonight. Like when they would hit a shot, I would tell myself timeout, and Jamal was calling a timeout. Like he was calling timeouts in the right pockets tonight, but not making the changes to the lineup have been the issue, and I think was the issue again tonight. Like you just got to go get shooting at this point if they're gonna continue to crowd the paint and you're going to be you know kicking out to Joe Ingles and Gary Harris in the corners I'll take that all all day I don't care if they're missing 15 threes in a row whatever at least we tried again it cannot get worse it can't you're the worst team in the league in offensive rating in the second half of games you have to do something and we're 11 games in now we've seen this play out now it seems like four or five times I think like against the Clippers, against the Mavs, against the Nets, against the Bulls, to a certain extent, you know, when you lose the the the, the Lakers game in LA. That's five just off the top of my head. There might even be more than that. Like, yeah. we, we are seeing this. Something needs to happen. We cannot continue to do this all season long. It's, it, it, it would be coaching malpractice to continue to watch this over and over and over again. And I don't want to say, oh, the Magic need to add shooting. The Magic need to add shooting. The Magic has shooting. It's sitting on the bench in Gary Harris and Joe Ingles and in, in, in Jet Howard and in, in Cole Anthony to a certain extent. Like, you, you got to do sure. something. Cole Anthony, for sure. You're talking about needing a spark in general. Sure, Cole's not off to an incredible, efficient start. He struggled but really, a little bit recently. Like, let's let's be honest. It, but he, he's Of course, but good. it was like two games. And and so for me, like... It's a little more I, than that, I think. I, I, what, three? I mean, we've only played 11 games. This guy is going to figure it out. But we've seen it before. Oh, of course. But gonna have I'm his, saying... You know, highs and lows. And who knows? Maybe you bring him in and these are the opportunities he needs to get himself going for the rest of the season. I don't know. But I 
trust him to make a big shot down the stretch, if I'm being honest, over a lot of guys on this roster. Over, what, three of the guys in the starting lineup I trust Cole more than that close the games right now with a shot to, to win the game or to just get create a spark, give us something. So whatever. But, you know, I who knows how this is going to play out, what Mosley's going to do. This is the life of a 500 team, if I'm being completely honest. But it's also like you see the flashes of what this team could be in that first half. And all you got, you've got the foundation. Just get the guys around them. Put the shooters from there on the bench. Start staggering these lineups better. Rotations. Change them up a little bit. I don't, I mean, I don't care. It's like, just get something in there that can create some type of change. I I do think there is something to like, oh, this is the life of a 500 team because the biggest thing with going from like a, a an okay team to a good team is just your level of consistency. And a lot of times if you're a 500 team, that's one of the things that you're lacking the most. You're going to have incredible performances where you beat teams that you shouldn't. You're going to have crappy performances where you lose teams that you shouldn't. But finding that level of consistency where you can give consistent performances night after night after night, that's sort of what takes you to the next level. But I almost feel to a certain extent when it comes to the lineups, like that's like like almost negligence. Like Jamal Mosley knows like teams are going to game plan for us to have to make threes. Well, guess what? I'm going to go to guys down the stretch that are going to space the floor a bit more. And is that going to hurt some feelings like potentially? But we talk about keeping guys accountable. Part of that is, hey, we're here to win basketball games. If you're not going to give us results that are going to help us win basketball games, you're not going to be on the floor. And I, I think maybe the team isn't quite ready for like that level of accountability just yet. But I do think that's like one of the next steps. Like, w- w- let's talk about a guy like Jalen Suggs. He's had a, a hot sh- you know streak shooting the ball recently. He's up to 33%, you know, shooting the ball from behind the arc. That's okay, I guess. It's not where we wanted him to be, you know, 11 games into the season. We talked all off season where like if Jalen is going to start and play heavy minutes, he's got to be around league average. It's not that far off at 33%, but tonight, like down the stretch, like the late turnover where he just like dribbles the ball, like right to Alex Caruso and then fouls on the other end. It was pretty close. Did absolutely pull on the Jersey. People that were saying that Jalen Suggs didn't foul him. He absolutely pulled on Alex Caruso's Jersey. You can't do that makes a great play for the block, but like comes up a, a couple of possessions later with a with a, a tip to Goga and then also getting the the rebound over Nikola Vucevic. Like Jalen the Jalen Suggs experience is is such a, a roller coaster right now where he has like, you know, big games, you know, 20 point games like he has recently. And then tonight where I think he was like four of thirteen, has the late turnover and the foul. But then against makes, the Nets, he was, yeah. Against the Nets, 4 13, sorry. Uh, but then tonight has a, a couple of big assists down the stretch uh, to, to Goga. Uh, there was one other that I'm, I'm forgetting to who it was. And then has the big rebound late where it's like, man, you almost screwed this game up. And then you make like game saving plays at the end of the game. So right now, that's the, that's the Jalen Suggs experience right now. And yeah. like, he's a guy that just quite frankly, we need him to shoot the ball better. Well, what he's like six of twenty one in these last two games. He had a what two hot games in a row, and now in the right. last two, he's shooting twenty eight and a half percent from the field. But yet he's averaging two and a half steals a game. So it's like, hmm, I don't know. I at some point, like I mean, he's definitely been. I mean, if we're going by plus or minus in that Nets game, he was a minus twenty seven. So his sh- lack of shooting really hurt you in that Nets game, regardless of what he brought to the defensive end, Jonathan. Can we can we talk about a man that that deserves more flowers? Goga Bitaze. Producer Kevin and I gave him a shout out in the last episode, but he deserves one, especially after tonight. Jonathan, he had more offensive rebounds than defensive rebounds tonight. He had six offensive rebounds and five defensive for a total of eleven rebounds tonight. A plus six, the highest plus or minus of the game tonight against the Bulls. It just felt like whenever the Magic desperately needed something. Goga was there, whether it's for a quick dish under the basket, and he's gotten better around the rim and uh, in, in compared to where he was a few games ago when he was starting and playing in the closing group or around the closing group in the fourth quarter. 
he's he I, f- I feel like he's gotten better um don't get me wrong he's not perfect but anybody that's given me six offensive rebounds they're okay with me he did incredible in this game against the bulls the the magic might not have been able to win this game without Gogo Patase, with how messy and and mucky this game was. So we got a little bit of, of criticism in the the YouTube comments um, when Wendell first went down, and we started to talk about like the the backup centers and you know how maybe you know we wish the Magic would have upgraded you know in, in the off season and uh, how like the guys on the roster were going to fill the the Wendell gap and. I don't feel like we were totally wrong at the time, but what I will say is that both of those guys have like so far like exceeded expectations drastically. Um, right now, combined, we're getting 23 points a game. Both of those guys are shooting 60% from the floor. They're adding 13 rebounds per game, and Goga is basically a steal and a half and a block and a half per game and they're adding just under three assists they are doing more than filling the wendell carter jr minutes like those guys have been so great um we are now three and three uh, in the six games since wendell has gone down and like winning those games and and being in some of the games that we lost just does not happen without the way that goga batadze and, and mo wagner have both been playing we've talked about how they both give you something a little bit different. Um, but I mean, just, I, I can't say enough about the way that both of those guys have stepped up since Wendell has been out of the lineup. It obviously very much agree. And Goga on the rebounding side of the ball, like I said, tonight against the bulls has been great. Mo Wagner offensively has been a lot better than I anticipated. Now, the other thing I want to quickly talk about here, Jonathan, before we end up wrapping up here, is I appreciated like I'm, the silver lining is that we got to see what this rotation looks like with Gary Harris back in the lineup, and Anthony Black obviously still taking up the Markel Fultz minutes. I appreciate the close game because it wasn't a blowout in terms of I didn't have to see us clear the benches regardless of blowout win or blowout loss. We got to kind of see what this looks like. In this game, Jonathan, you you play 10 guys. J.I., they all play significant minutes. J.I. plays 17. Joe, Joe Ingles plays 18. Mo Wagner, 20. Cole Anthony, 22. Gary Harris, 21. Anthony Black, 27 minutes in this one. So my question is, when Markel really Fultz... We needed that uh, free throw down the stretch, though. Man. We, we really did. And that's the first thing I said was like, I don't know if I really want the rookie shooting the, these shots. Tash the first one. I was feeling pretty good after that one. Usually, if they make the first one, you are you're, yeah. you're you feel like the second one's probably going to be a make. Now, the, that begs a question. Markel Fultz comes back. Wendell comes back. You're not playing 12 guys. Gogo, my instant reaction is Gogo goes back to getting DMPs. Yeah. Unfortunate, but it is what it is. He served his role. We appreciate what he did. If Wendell goes down again, we know who we're calling, and we feel better about that situation now. But what happens? Markel Fultz comes back. AB, you've got to carve out minutes for him, right? Or do you not? I don't know that you do. I don't know that it's possible. I don't know that you can. And it's, it is it is insane. And trust me, if you were listening, screaming at me, saying, how could you think that Anthony Black can't get minutes after this? He's proven himself. Yes, but this all goes back. I agree back. with you. I'm this, wrong, and I agree with you, but <laughs> that's still what I think. That This all goes back to what Weltman said. The Magic are going to be good enough that the rookies can't just think that just because they got picked in the lottery or just because they got picked in the first round that they are going to get minutes. It's going to be much like the Goga thing for me. Anthony Markel comes back. Thanks, Anthony. Appreciate what you did. And now we feel comfortable. If one of our guards goes down, we're excited because AB gets minutes. This is what happens when you have a deep team. Nobody is a superstar yet, but you just have a very solid yeah. deep team. Yeah, there's, and no, there's a couple no, of guys that aren't no, but, going nobody's, anywhere, but. nobody's a superstar. We'll get there, but nobody's oh, You there. watch your mouth. I'll remember that. <laughs> Clip that. Nobody, Clip that, nobody right now. So, um... So yeah, I, I think that this it's going. The season is just going to get more and more interesting as the season develops. 
the storylines are going to continue to be, can the Magic get healthy and stay healthy? How does Mosley handle the second half woes? Because there's really no other way to describe it. This team is like you are laid out first in the rankings. They are awful in the second half. Something's got to give. You've got to mix up something. At some point, as a coach, you've got to just be sick to your stomach about how these games go. And you'll never feel safe with the first half lead. You've done it 10 out of 11 times. And yet this team is 6-5. and five. By the way, can I just say how relieved I am that we have six wins? Because last year, I, I want to say it was once we were six, we were five and 20, and then we won to make it six and 20. And that was the start of that win streak. But that was your first, you got your sixth win on December 7th last year. So I will say a moment for that because I am very thankful for it. But you're six and five, you've had the lead in 10 out of 11 games. Figure it out. You have to figure something out here, and you've got to mix it up. And we've said it a hundred times. You've this had episode. the lead at some point in every game, but you've had the halftime lead. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Ten yeah. out of eleven games, and then, like we've yeah. talked about, the second half's just been terrible. What I'm like genuinely concerned about is the tendonitis with Markel. Like, I, that's just he, something that doesn't always just go away and, and doesn't come back. Like that, that's something that can be a nagging, recurring thing. We saw him miss three games came back, played one game, and now has missed the last three. And I, from what I... I saw somebody correct somebody and be like, if it was a tear or something, yes. But if it's tendonitis, like it, with the proper treatment, blah, 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 it can go away or it'd be whatever. And But then I'm thinking like, you might be saying that generally speaking, if someone has, I don't know, three, four weeks to be off of it. Right. But for an athlete, for a guy that plays basketball every day for his job... That is something that's going to be very difficult because it also, for Markel Fultz, this is a contract year. The last thing you want is a nagging injury. So I wonder if he's just out for weeks and then just so they hopefully can, I guess, cure it best as possible. And then he comes back and he's ready to go. But yeah, that's the other thing is that I have really bad feelings about down the stretch of the season, Markel Fultz warming up, and all of a sudden we get a notification that he's not going to suit up after he wasn't even on the injury report, much like he was against the Bucks. Yeah, but, it's happened twice now. Yes, but and the, with the Anthony Bucks Black game, in the fold, I I it, it I feel better. I don't feel great about it. Markel Fultz not playing, but I feel better about it. Honestly, when he was ruled out against the Jazz, you know, it it came like forty you know minutes before tip yep. off. Against the Bucks, it came like 15 minutes before tip-off. Yeah, it was crazy. It's like, okay, he, he had more than enough time to go through warm-ups and for you guys to reevaluate him. You still put him in the starting lineup, and then like 20 minutes before the game, you're like, oh, no, you can't play? Like, that's that's super concerning. And I, I know that you and Kevin talked about it, but like that messes with guys' psyche. Like, Anthony Black wasn't, you know preparing to start he thought Markel was in the the lineup probably wondering if he was going to play at all and then hey boom hey buddy you're starting and although I'm sure he relishes the opportunity to play but like these guys have like physical and mental routines that they go through to get themselves ready for games and that I'm, I'm sure you know throws everybody off to a to a degree so really want to get that figured out uh, as soon as possible yeah all right, um, looking ahead to the rest of the week here. So we've got the Bulls again on Friday. So the Magic will have the day off in Chicago on Thursday. And then the in-season tournament game on Friday. Again, if you're in the Orlando area, we're having our first watch party of the season at Wall Street Plaza. Uh, it's going to start about 7.30. Game starts at 8. So make sure you come through for that. Going to be $5 Michelob Ultra bottles, $20 buckets of Michelob Ultra Two for one drinks leading up to the watch party from five to eight. So make sure that you guys come out. It's going to be a great time. And then finishing the week off Sunday uh, at Indiana, that game is early tip off five o'clock. So we'll be able to uh, record our, our normal time loop, which will be nice. But yeah, let's uh that that Indiana game. Indiana is good, man. Tyrese Halliburton is incredible. Yeah. He's got something like thirty two assists the last two games with no turnovers. And uh, that's like going to be a 60- tough one. They got like a sixty day rest going out of that game too. They uh they play Wednesday, they play today, uh no, Tuesday, and they don't play again until Sunday. So that's absolutely um, crazy. Yeah, they've got like a 
four or five day rest. When you're off that much, though, I kind of like us, you know, yeah. just having, you know, one day off and still being in rhythm. I feel like you're being off for four days. That's a lot of time in the middle of the season. Yeah. And that's something. And it's an yeah, early I, tip off. Might be able to dude, catch Indiana slacking. Yeah. That's what producer Kevin brought up the point of, too. Last episode, I, you know, it. we'll see. I hope that that's the case. I hope they, but yeah, I just think Indiana is very good. So we'll see how it goes. Well, let's put the final freaking nail in the coffin of this uh, iteration of Chicago Bulls on Friday. Let's blow them out at home uh, in season tournament game. I, I talked to my wife about this earlier today. You know, they're going to have the big screen set up at, at Wall Street Plaza. They can put as much Orlando si- like Orlando Magic signage and everything like that that they want Wall Street Plaza. Because of that in season tournament court, Wall Street Plaza is going to be glowing red. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've watched any of the in-season yeah. tournament games with some of these red floors. You can't even see the ball. Like you can't see the ball against that red floor. So it's just going to be a horrible uh, visual experience. But hopefully the Magic come out with a, a big in-season tournament dub. Yeah. Don't forget the Magic Duvin collab uh, coming up. That uh, pop up is going to be November 30th from 4 to 10 at the yard on Ivanhoe. And then those will be available for purchase uh, at Amway and the Magic Team Shop and the Magic Team Shop at Cor- Concourse 107 on December 1st at 7 p.m. That's going to do it for this one. For Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You all have been listening to The Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Six Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!